It will be taken by temporary clerk, Alderman Clay. Alderman Clay, could you please call the roll? Sure, Mr. Chairman. Um, Alderman Thibodeau? Here. Alderman Sullivan? Here. Alderman Clay is here. Alderman Dowd? And Alderman at Large O'Brien? Chair. Present. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you have four in attendance. I declare a quorum. Also in attendance is Director Cummings of Administrative Services, and we're going to have various other speakers. Uh, at this particular time, we're going to we got to do a little bit of housework to nominate a clerk. Do you have something that want you press it in it? Okay, thank you, Director Cummings. So, <clears throat> I will. Uh, entertain a motion, Alderman Clee says that she would graciously step in and become the new clerk to the uh, Infrastructure Committee. So, uh, would anybody like to perform the nomination? I'll second that. Okay. We have a motion by Alderman Sullivan to nominate Alderman Clee to serve as committee clerk for the 2024 to 2025 term. Uh, do we have a motion to close nominations? Alderman Tiavo so moves that the uh, nominations be closed. And uh, we need a nomination to elect. Yeah, uh, a motion to elect. All those, I think. Yeah, I, I can make a motion to elect myself. You do not. Why not? <laughs> Why don't we have Alderman Tiavo? <laughs> Motion to, I don't know the word. Elect, elect me. Elect. elect. Yeah. <laughs> Alderman Clee. That would do it for me. All right. Motion for Alderman Clee to become a committee clerk for the 2024 uh, 2024 to 25 term. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Polls. Motion carries. Public comment. Anybody from the public would like to speak? Okay. Yes, please step forward. Uh, you'll have three minutes, Alderman Clee. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, let me so, turn that yeah, on. Sorry, we'll catch up. Uh, could you state your name and your address? And again, we'll be, uh, I think this is your first time in speaking before us. It is. So you can watch the clock. You'll have three minutes to do so. Okay, okay. thank you. So what? thank what? you. You may continue. Great. My name is Nate DeSelms. I live on 34 Bates Drive, and uh, I'd like to talk about a complete streets policy for Nashua. Uh, complete streets are streets that accommodate people however they want to travel, if that's by foot, by bike, public transportation, or car. I'm also part of the Nashua Strong Towns group. Uh, and complete streets are personally important to me. Um, on my road, uh, it's very wide, it's a neighborhood road, but people drive very quickly on it because it's just a really wide road, you know, no markings, no anything. And uh, I believe a complete streets, you know, approach to designing our neighborhood roads would uh, make our neighborhoods more pleasant, it would calm traffic, it would make it safer for pedestrians, bicyclists, who, you know, people out walking their dog, doing whatever. Uh, I also enjoy riding my bike downtown and um, sometimes it feels like there's a lack of infrastructure. It feels a little unsafe when I'm riding around certain areas with cars around me. And also sometimes I have trouble finding the right place to uh, lock my bike up once I get downtown. Um, so I think uh, Nashua adopting a complete streets policy would really uh, benefit you know, the things I'm talking about, It'd be really helpful in those areas. Um, and Nashua Strong Towns has a complete streets policy ready to use for this purpose. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else would like to? Yes, please step forward. Uh, can you state your name and your address? And we do have a three minute. Great, thank you. Um, David Fiore, and I live at 23 Norton Street, Ward 3. Uh, uh, um, 
Patricia is my alderman. <laughs> and uh, first, thank you all for your service. I realize leadership is service, and you guys do a lot of work, and we, we really appreciate it. Um, I, too, want to talk about the Complete Streets policy, which uh, uh, the strong local Strong Towns group has put together. Uh, I want to just talk for a moment about Strong Towns. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the movement. It was started by a guy named Charles Marin, who wrote a book called Strong Towns. He was a city planner. And he asked the question, are these investments we're making in the city, do they pay off? And what he found was that um, in many cases that they, they don't. And what happens when a city is not fiscally uh, solvent is they just fail to do the job well. Now, of course, Nashville is one of the best run cities uh, in the country. This is great. But we want to make it even better. And the Strong Towns approach says, uh, the downtown is the most profitable part of your city. Every dollar of investment in your downtown actually has a, a net benefit in, uh, in tax revenue, if it's, if it's done properly, obviously. So um, it's a downtown first approach. And so we came up with this complete streets policy, which many municipalities in New England are, have adopted, Cambridge, Portsmouth. I think Manchester has one, and, uh, and they see many positive benefits to it. My personal desire is to see a, a downtown, a main street that is walkable, bikeable, where it is pleasant to be, where you don't have cars zooming by fast. Um, not that we wouldn't allow cars through, but, but that it would be a pleasant place for pedestrians and bicyclists um, as well as cars. One of the key features that, that I would like to see out of the streets complete streets policy for Nashua downtown is protected bike lanes on each side and traffic calming, which I believe will, you know, rel I realize nothing's cheap when you're talking about the city, but it's a relatively low cost investment that significantly enhances the livability and desirability of downtown, um, making it a much more attractive place to live. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Anybody else who would like to come in and join in with public comment? And, Miss, the same rules apply. Please introduce yourself, name, and address in a three minute. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Um, my name is Marina Vaz. I live on 391 Lake Ave, Manchester, New Hampshire. I'm here tonight in my capacity as the Nashua based environmental justice advocate with the Conservation Law Foundation. I'm here to state my support for a complete streets policy in Nashua. This would shift transportation infrastructure, as other folks have explained, from its current car-centric design to be inclusive of a, of a variety of modes of transportation, such as walking, cycling, using scooters, and other micro-mobility options, and public transit options. This policy is consistent with and conducive to many of the goals that were outlined um, in Nashua's latest master plan, such as increasing pedestrian foot traffic and micro-mobility miles traveled, increasing the safety of our streets for all with pedestrians, uh, cyclists, and public transit riders uh, also taken into account of those safety considerations, um, decreasing carbon emissions related to transportation, which is the largest contributing sector to the state's greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so. Supporting a complete streets policy, I believe, is an important step in the right direction as we make changes towards becoming a city that meets transportation needs for residents of all ages, abilities, and income. It's imperative that we center folks who depend on what are considered you know, alternative modes of transportation second to driving. Um, so I would like to ask the, the committee here to consider centering not only those means of transportation, but also the folks that rely on them, um, such as cycling, walking, public transportation throughout this process. And that is what I have. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Welcome, sir. Same rules apply. Your name and address in three minutes, sir. You got it. Uh, name is Darian Glasser. Uh, address is 3 West Trade Drive. Uh, hey folks, I'm a resident of Ward 9. I'm here to advocate for a complete streets policy, as you probably would have guessed. Uh, <laughs> I'm part of Nashua Strong Towns. We're a group dedicated to promoting everything from efficient, economically sound land use to beautiful, walkable communities. You've heard from a few folks all right, uh, already about why complete streets policy would be beneficial for them. At Nashua Strong Towns, we, uh, we've built a um, 
sorry, a Nashua Strongtown has built a complete streets policy specifically for this purpose, taking community input from interested Nashua citizens over the course of the last few months. I'd like to take a little bit of time to summarize the proposal. Our goal with the complete streets policy is to accommodate residents of all ages and abilities who travel by foot, bicycle, public transportation, and automobile. Ensuring we're able to prioritize folks in all types of transportation will be not good not just for providing considerable savings to the city of Nashua, as pedestrian-centric infrastructure tends to cost significantly less over the life of the infrastructure, but additionally, it is incredibly good for small businesses, according to numerous studies we've cited in the policy. For, complete, for our Nashua's Complete Streets policy, we've opted to take inspiration from Howard County, Maryland, named as having one of the most complete and strongest Complete Streets policies in America by Smart Growth America. While metrics for success are provided, excuse me, while metrics of success are provided, um, I lost my spot. Uh, <laughs> Um, are provided in the policy, all, almost all recommended action is taken by changing street design to be more pedestrian oriented. We understand changing streetscapes is expensive. We want to ensure that with this policy that changes are iterative and low to the cost, uh, low to, cost to the taxpayer of Nashua. We propose in this policy that changes happen during routine road maintenance to ensure the cost of reshaping a street is just a normal line item during construction. This iterative rollout ensures that if changes to the design need to be made over time, it can be done so um, as it changes the needs of the uh, city of Nashua change. In our policy proposal, we list four major street types. Um, we include a, uh, propose a main street street type for higher density mixed use areas, one with one, automobile, one with one automobile lane going in each direction, as well as protected cycle lanes on both sides of the street with ex extra wide sidewalks. We propose a boulevard, a wide street type similar to DW Highway or Amherst Street for higher speed automobile traffic that has two car lanes in both directions, protected cycle lanes in both directions and wide sidewalks. We additionally propo um, provide proposals for both thin suburban streets, we call neighborhood yield streets, and wide suburban uh, streets we call a neighborhood street, similar to those in both Ward 9 and Ward, uh, Ward 3 and Ward 9 respectively. For thin suburban streets, not much needs to be done. For wide suburban streets- 30 seconds. Uh, we recommend providing protected cycle lanes and removal of double stripe parking, uh, sorry, yellow lines in the median. Um, finally, we propose all intersections follow the National Association of City Transportation Officials Protected Intersections Design Guideline. In order for this to work, we need uh, additionally thinner uh, lanes for automobiles, 9 to 10 feet, and removal of most center turning lanes. I have two copies available of the policy here, and you can additionally you can find uh, digital copies at nashuastrongtowns.org slash blog. Thank you for your time. We hope you will consider this policy proposal from the citizens of Nashua. I Thank you. Time. Would you like to submit that to the clerk? I would. You can even keep the folder, too, if you like. Mm -hmm. I'm keeping the pen, though. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else from the public with a comment? Seeing none. Uh, Director Cummings, a couple more house cleaning items. Yeah, yeah, yes, that's right, Mr. Chairman. For the record, Tim Cummings, Director of Administrative Services. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to ask that uh, you uh, actually take up uh, the parking study first this evening. That's R24007 and that we do the downtown circulation after, that's R24006, that's not how your current agenda reads. And I would also uh, encourage the, the public participants who are here this evening to stay for that presentation. I think they would find that very informative and, and interesting. But uh, again, Mr. Chairman, if we could take up R24007 first, I'd appreciate it, thank you. Okay, without ex uh, exception, we will do so. Um, communication? Sorry, just trying to get organized here. Sorry. None. Unfinished business? There's none. And since there's no objection, we're going to take up R-24007-007, relative to the acceptance of a 2022 2023 Downtown National Parking Study for the use as guidance in planning and future decision making. Alderman Clee, do you have a motion? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. I motion to recommend final approval, a final passage of, of R-24-007. Okay. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Do we need to have a presentation first? Before? Well, yeah, let's do the presentation. Yeah, <laughs> top of the year, uh, get used to it. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Liz Hannum, uh, Economic Development Director. Um, we are bringing to you uh, the long-awaited parking study. 
Um, and we're gonna have Andy Hill from Desmond uh, Designs come up and give the presentation. Yeah, please uh, have a, have a, seat. Have a seat. you can have sit a seat. in a good seat, please. <laughs> You know how to turn on the light? Or is it down here? Yeah. Oh, Joe here. Thanks. And I believe um, uh, Andy has a PowerPoint presentation. Yes. So yes. he may need the mouse. Is it being loaded here? Yes. Yep. Is it on here? No, it's in the, uh, the, the, the clock up. I know, but I have to load it up. It's at the, so, at the bottom there, the pop point. Oh, over here. Yeah, okay. that one. So this one here? Is it? Uh, this it's one. the next one, yeah. Okay. Right? No, I know, but it's, it's not even the, it's not even uh, the thing. Yeah, you got to go to the uh, share screen. The share screen? Share screen, yeah. Over here, okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, no, yeah. Right here, no. Up here. Did test, yeah. No, I've got it here, so it's got to be the clerk's yeah. PC. Yeah, clerk's PC. Yep, there you go, and okay. you get the clicker form. That's it. Mm -hmm. But it's what I'm saying, Mike, is it's not coming up as a as a slideshow. Slide oh, it will. Okay. He'll do that. Yeah. No. no, it should still come up here. It's not. Yeah, it should still. Um, did we go to view? No, it's not even changing. Slideshow, right? It's it's like it's stuck. Oh, okay. It's frozen. Um, it's frozen. Is it on this hard drive? It is. Okay. Uh, it should be on the hard drive. Not, uh, what's yours? Yeah. All right. In, in lieu of the PowerPoint presentation, I will be reading the entire 361-page document <laughs> word for word. We'll get the well, we get started, then. Unfortunately, folks, we have some uh, technical difficulties. We're going to break for a quick commercial. Uh, <laughs> we'll be back extremely shortly. Uh, stay in your seats. Can you stand there with the poster board? Or? Oh. That used, how about the whiteboard? That used to work. Yeah, it's not letting me pull up uh, in the slideshow. Yeah, it's not even coming up. Yeah, I was just going to say it's not even coming up. Yeah. Did you try and plug in, plug it back in? <laughs> Are you going to come in and try to pull up? I just come up. I know you do. I'm going to end the slideshow. <laughs>
Yeah, well then you just do it as a PDF. But it's, t it's not even going. It's like a trophy. There's something wrong with the new one. I go to one to click one. on another yeah, page. Yeah. Andy, could you email it? He's trying to jump, jump on the Zoom right now. No, I'm actually going to oh. transfer uh, the document over into it. I, it sounds like there is an issue with the. Um, uh, we got it. No, uh, let's, let's. Yep. Oh, yeah. We got it. Yeah. Okay. Did we do it? Yes. yes. Got it. Right. He's a big <laughs> Are we going to have the same issue with the other one? <laughs> it's fine, Trish. You just reverse the polarity. <laughs> For the record, my name is Andy Hill. I'm the Director of um, Consulting Services for Desmond Design Management. We are um, the lead on the team that put together the parking plan. Uh, we've been working on this now since um, uh, early 2020. Um, and I'm very pleased tonight to take you through a very high level um, review of the plan and the different recommendations. Uh, this is the third or fourth time that we brought uh, brought this before the um, uh, the board of aldermen. Um, I am going to try and be as expeditious as possible on this, so I'm hoping that you might be able to hold your uh, questions until the end. Joe, there we go. Um, as you can see outlined on the screen, there were six initial uh, large-scale study plan objectives for this engagement. These were taken uh, almost verbatim from the original RFP, and these were uh, the framing charge that we had as we went into this engagement here. The study area itself is uh, substantial. I think you just shoot it to that. Yeah, you have to aim right for the... Not me. Yeah. <laughs> it's below here. It's below there? Yeah. I can just hit in. <laughs> if I just hit enter, will it do it? Line. If we can advance to the next slide. Oh, somebody did. I didn't oh. touch anything. Or we could just break it. It's broken. Okay. Is the computer even on anymore? It says end of slideshow. Oh, so hit the escape button. Okay. Not there. Yeah, it must have caught up with all the pushing. <laughs> all the clicks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let's start over again. Is this not going to work now? Can drive. Okay. I'll just hit, just tell me when oh, they go hit back. The, there, there we go. go. Perfect. Got okay. It both ways. So the scope of this <laughs> engagement <laughs> included 108 total blocks uh, across the downtown area. We actually divided those initially into six different zones to help the analysis. Um, there are tremendous num. Uh, there are a wide variety of statistics um, associated with this area. The one that I want you to keep in your mind going forward is we counted uh, tick over 13,000 total parking spaces within the 108 block area. We did actually perform uh, field observations to establish baseline occupancy and turnover on two different dates uh, in the fall of October uh, 2021. And then we came back for uh, the 
Valentine's Day weekend in February of 2022. Go to the next slide, please. Major takeaways from this, um, at no point did we see overall utilization across the area exceed 50% of the supply. We did note that um, private parking facilities represented 70% of the supply. Remember, we had 13,300 spaces and a tick uh, over 9,000 of those were in the private sector here. And for the most part, um, those were consistently uh, utilized at 50% or less. Um, we did note there were some off-street facilities that were running up or near capacity at times, but overall, the off-street public parking uh, supply was significantly available at all given times. Um, we did look at the on-street supply as well, which represented the smallest portion, but the largest level of utilization. And we did identify within that 58 block faces that were running at 85% or higher utilization at times. 85% utilization is sort of a magic number within the parking industry because it is the point at which it becomes very difficult for an individual to find that one or two available parking spaces on any given block face. Uh, it's also referred to as effectively full or perceptively full, although there may be some available spaces. Where we did identify uh, these block faces running at uh, this very high level of utilization, we made some recommendations for converting those basically to the next level of regulation. So if there was no time limit on it, there was a recommendation to impose a time limit on it uh, in order to create some turnover and availability at the curbside. If they were at a lower meter rate, we suggested going up to a higher rate, meter rate again. The interest in doing this is so that we can balance supply and demand across the area and make sure that there's curbside parking available at every block face that an individual pulls up to. Um, we spent quite a bit of time, uh, because we were at the time testing the uh, downtown uh, on-street dining program uh, as a result of COVID. So we did spend quite a bit of time looking at Main Street uh, exclusively from the river all the way down to the Hollis Street junctures here. Uh, one of the big takeaways that we got from that is about 20% of the vehicles we looked at on several different survey days were parking well in excess of the posted time limits. Uh, another 5% were engaged in what we like to refer to as shuffling, which is not against the law, uh, but it is against the spirit or best interest of operations here where folks are coming out and moving their car every two hours. Here. Uh, just as a quick reference, uh, it's included within the study, but um, if we can get the slide to come up. Do you want me to get in there? Uh, man, can you advance? This is going bad. <laughs> this is the new computer, too. Can you advance up there? I'm trying to hit enter, and it's not going. Try the arrow. I tried the arrow, too. Space bar. See, you got to say please before you press the button. Uh, I'm going to advance forward unless anybody has any issues. There's uh, not a lot that is necessarily needs to be seen visually. Uh, once I get to the point where you need to be looking at particular statistics, we'll go back to the program. Uh, one of the things that we took a look at uh, was zoning on a comprehensive basis as it applies to parking. Uh, we benchmarked um, the zoning that's in place currently against 11 comparable communities. Uh, overall, we didn't find any major issues with that. Um, when we looked at the minimum parking requirements uh, mandated by the city of Nashua versus a lot of these comparable communities, we found that they were absolutely in line and reasonable. The thing to note is that these minimum parking requirements did not apply to most of our study area, which was in the D1 and D2 districts. That area is subject to a blanket waiver of minimum parking requirements right now. Um, when we looked at that, um, one of the concerns that was raised to us was that this blanket waiver essentially removed a lot of incentives for developers to engage in more sustainable practices, uh, promoting transit as an alternative, 
or bike share or car share or anything along those lines. Sustainability has been highly highlighted in recent planning documents for Nashua, but right now within the D1, D2 area, because there are no parking requirements, there's essentially no stick, if you will, to drive developers toward that particular carrot. Um, and that's something important to keep in mind as you go forward here because this is the area we're going to see the greatest density of development. This is the area where you would really like to see um, folks initiating uh, more programs to support sustainable development. But right now, with the absence of minimum parking requirements, which are usually the stick that drives folks to the carrot of um, introducing some of these measures to get around those parking requirements, there's no incentive right now. There's also a concern that in the long time, long term, um, it may not be fiscally sustainable for Nashua to continue to be the primary provider of parking in the D1 and D2 districts. Thus far, they've been very successful in doing that. Um, but one of the things that you will have to consider going forward as a board is what is the express mission or goal for the public parking system if it is self-supporting and uh, self-sustainability that may require a whole series of adjustments to policy right now uh, that will take you in one direction if uh, the interest is continuing to provide uh, parking at subsidy then that could take a lot of your policy making in a different direction uh, going forward here. Um, we engage in substantial amount of public engagement. Uh, we worked with a very generous 20 person working group throughout the course of this engagement. Um, met with them uh, 11 different times to work through issues, challenges, concepts, ideas, review, uh, draft working written product as we went through this process. They were absolutely crucial uh, to the success of this engagement. In addition, we had nine different meetings with different stakeholder groups to really get their particular input, um, including uh, the downtown, um, the, the national downtown group here. Uh, we hosted two different public forums as informative uh, presentations here. One of them really highlighting what we had seen and what we thought were the initial challenges to the system. The other one uh, highlighting what particular solutions we were considering to address those challenges. Um, part of what came out of that was also uh, two online surveys that we conducted in tandem with those forums. They got about 1,100 responses back. Uh, all this is contained within the document. It's fascinating reading. The chief parking concerns that sort of came out of this entire process were really four, and this is by order of occurrence here. Number one, the thing that we heard most from folks was um, concerns about the availability of public parking, either now or going into the future. Uh, right behind that, safety. Safety within the parking facility, safety on the streets, moving from the parking facilities to different destinations. Uh, there was a desire to see more communication uh, with the general public with regards to not only parking options, but also transportation options going forward. And number four, uh, it won't come as a surprise to anybody sitting on this board right now, overnight parking was a consideration um, and something that uh, the general public indicated they were very interested in seeing addressed uh, at some point in the future. Um, in addition to this, we also did a comprehensive operational assessment where we looked at every aspect of how public parking is handled or managed in terms of operations uh, within the downtown. That included benchmarking um, against 11 different comparable communities, looking at a whole lot of, of different <coughs> operating aspects, and as well as looking at best practices. Uh, big things I want to highlight to you folks here, sort of as takeaways. One was the financial structures that exist right now is very hard to track. It's very difficult to see where money is coming into the parking system and where it's coming out. So it's very difficult to determine whether it's truly self-supporting or whether it's being substantially subsidized. Our recommendation was to look at moving that financial structure over to an enterprise fund, uh, which would consolidate those revenues and expenses in one place, uh, which would give you a better uh, shot at transparency as well as sustainability where the public parking system was concerned. Um, we also found that the parking department needed to do some homework with the Board of Aldermen 
there needed to be a consensus as to what the public parking system was supposed to do in the future. Um, for example, there are communities who have stated the number one objective for their public parking is that it's to be fiscally self-sustaining. There are others that have indicated that the number one job of the public parking system is to handle parking needs so that downtown development can move forward here. There are very few places where both of those can be done at the same time. Um, so um, one of the things that needs to happen as the Board of Aldermen moves forward with this plan is to really work with the parking department and the general public to figure out what they really need their parking system to do and then start doing a lot of the formation development of policies to support that central guiding mission here. Um, the other thing that we noted was the parking department lacks adequate staffing to perform most of the functions that they're currently responsible for. We didn't necessarily look at if growth occurs in the downtown of the future, how many more people you're going to need to handle these functions. We looked at exactly what they need to do right now on a day-by-day -day basis in order to uh, enforce the parking rules that are currently on the books in order to take care of the assets that you currently have in possession. And what we found kind of consistently is that there literally were not enough physical bodies in order to accommodate uh, what the parking department has to do on a given day. And so there are some recommendations for addressing that through strategic hiring going forward in the future. Um, part of that strategic hiring will also help consolidate some of the functions that are done by other parking, other departments that could be brought into the parking department. Uh, which would create some greater efficiencies and also consolidate services in one particular area. Um, as the assessment that was done about the same time we are doing our study on the physical condition of the parking garage so showed, there's a significant amount of deferred maintenance with the parking assets that you have currently in place. Uh, one of the ways that you can address that as it's going to be a perpetual issue in the future is the establishment of a sinking fund. And one of our recommendations was to create that sinking fund going forward as part of the enterprise fund so that as you had to do those major repairs and replacements in the future, you had that money already to draw from that fund that was compounding on a regular basis. Um, we identified a lot of different places where you could improve service, you could improve security, you could reduce overhead by introducing different types of technology um, that would help the public parking system. Uh, both do things more efficiently and also um, free up their people for higher and better uses and deliver better services to the constituency as well. Uh, we also spent quite a bit of time looking at um, how parking enforcement is handled right now, all the way from the number of people that you're putting out to enforce the uh, ordinances you already got on the books, up to how fine rates are structured, um, and how effective they are at meeting the objectives um, for reducing uh, regular recidivist behavior, uh, as well as towing. Uh, we also took a look at the parking rates that are currently in place right now, some of which haven't been adjusted in 20 years. We looked at them relative to the peer institutions, but then we also looked at them for their general intent. Are they creating turnover uh, that you're hoping for and availability of the curb? And we came up with a number of different recommendations. I'm not going to delve too deep into these, but with the fine system, uh, what we really did was take a look at the existing fine system. Uh, we looked at it relative to comparable rates in the other communities, and we also looked at the structure of it here. One of the things that is on the books right now is policies to prevent repeat offenses over and over again, but the way the ordinances are written right now, it's very difficult to figure out what constitutes a repeat event uh, offense other than the same person doing the same thing five or six times right in a row. Um, this restructuring of the fine structure here uh, allows for better enforcement on that, and it also allows for a um, more logical structure for the general constituent so they can understand why uh, some fines are significantly higher than others because they represent uh, life safety issues or issues to the general public. Some fines are significantly lower. Um, the hope was that uh, these fine structures would be low enough to be affordable, um, but high enough to um, prevent uh, regular repeat um, 
instances of, of that behavior. Uh, similarly, on the rates that you've got currently in place, on the transients or meter rates that are currently in place, we did make a lot of recommendations for change. There were some small adjustments uh, that were several years out of date in order to generate enough um, turnover uh, to achieve where downtown is right now in its evolution. Um, we also had made some recommendations for adjusting both hours and enforcement. Uh, when the last set of rate structures was put in place, downtown was primarily an office and daytime destination. Now with the opening of uh, the new performance center downtown, as well as the um, number of residences that are coming in, some of the changes to uh, the street level uh, commercial spaces, it's definitely becoming uh, more of a nighttime destination. And right now the parking enforcement hours don't necessarily reflect that. Uh, so we had made some recommendations for changing that. Uh, we had also made some recommendations for revising the permit program, primarily to recognize uh, that there was, um, there needed to be greater choice available to consumers here as to where they parked, uh, how much parking they wanted to buy right now. The current system uh, that's in place is sort of a one size fits all. Um, and as your downtown continues to evolve and grow, you're going to find that um, some folks want the cheapest parking they can find, and they want it only during weekdays or only on the overnight. Some folks want 24 seven access everywhere they can go. So we tried to create a program that would provide that kind of choice for constituents moving forward, uh, and also bring the rates up to a level that's more comparable to the communities that are around you. Next slide, please. Looks like we're back on track. Maybe. More or less. We are. I just um, keep going out and coming back in. <laughs> or not. Um, just keep we going back in and going out, yeah. We also did a future needs assessment, um, which really looked at all the development that was planned or projected coming into the downtown in the future. Over the next 10 years, uh, we organized, we created a demand model specific to Nashua uh, based on Urban Land Institute and Institute of Transportation Engineer methodology and then use that to project uh, demand going forward really under one of three general headings. Uh, near term, which is anything from zero to four years. This is stuff that's either already in construction or was already in construction when we started the project, uh, or stuff that's anticipated to start construction in the very near term, or vacant space that we assume to be absorbed at some point over this term. Uh, Midterm, uh, really dealt with a lot of projects that were in concept plan yet, but hadn't necessarily filed plans for actual development, uh, as well as Southern New Hampshire Medical Center's master plan. They were kind enough to share that with us. Uh, we factored that into the midterm scenarios as well. And then with the long-term scenarios, that was stuff that was eight to 10 years out that was more of a bigger uh, planning initiative covered in some of the other documents that we looked at. We want to represent the impacts of that without necessarily knowing the specifics on those developments, so we made some uh, assumptions as to what those land uses would be. In each case, we provided a snapshot on what the impacts of those developments would do to the area on a weekday, a weekday evening, a weekend, and a week, weekday evening. And when we looked at this um, impacts, we looked at them as cumulative. So. Um, we took a look at near term and then we assumed that midterm included everything that happened in near term plus the additional development. Uh, and then we looked at long term, it was including everything in near term, mid term plus the long term development as well. Um, and we assumed no corrective action. So this was not necessarily because we believed the city of Nashville would take no corrective actions, but to give them an order of magnitude for where the potential shortfalls uh, we're likely to incur in the future um, because that really would help inform um, what they may want to do from a future development standpoint as far as augmenting the existing supply, where that should go. Uh, we covered uh, that in, in great detail within the document, again, including a presentation of 10 different uh, physical alternatives for adding additional supply. I'm not going to go delve into that right now. In terms of the big takeaways from that, what really came away from that is at some point in the midterm, we are going to need to introduce 
a new parking supply somewhere at the north end of Main Street up by the river and somewhere at the south end of Main Street down by Hollow Street. And there are a number of different locations for addressing that. All of those are contained within the analysis. Um, but uh, regardless of everything else that the city of Nashville might do going forward, um, it is fairly apparent that at some point uh, you will have to introduce some additional supply, um, probably as a public asset or a public-private venture, and again, at those two ends of town. Um, can we bring up the slide that says <laughs> parking planning organization principles? Because this I is, can try. This is a critical one. This is one of the ones. Well, we're going to go back in, yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we'll do it again this way. Which what's it called? The parking. Parking planning organization this one? principles. Yeah. So this one is important. I want to take a little time on this because this really formed the basis for us starting to develop the implementation plan, uh, and we looked at these five critical principles as conditions that needed to be met in one way or another. Uh, condition number one being uh, that we wanted to create a parking system that was essentially self, a self-supporting enterprise. Um, that we wanted to forward fund any improvements as we went along so that you're not looking at subsidizing it or subsidizing it through the general fund but rather creating a revenue stream that um, covers the cost of these improvements as you went along. Um, we wanted to make sure that we had staffed and equipped the parking department adequately so that they could actually continue to deliver and improve on the services that they're already required to provide. Um, wherever we could, we wanted to seek out opportunities to promote sustainable practices. Uh, and we wanted to make sure that the parking system continued to meet its uh, goal of supporting continued growth in downtown. So what we did is we put together a five-year plan. Uh, within this five-year plan, we looked at um, a bunch of sub-initiatives that fell under each one of those headings. And most critically, uh, based on conversations we had had with the Board of Aldermen last fall where we were just focused on um, going through the plan without necessarily talking about uh, the fiscal impacts, we spent quite a bit of time developing a financial model and really taking a look at if this can be self-supporting going forward. Uh, and I know that this is very small, um, and this is uh, your first time seeing this, in part because it is conceptual. I'm sure that at some point in the future as we refine this model a little bit further, uh, I will be handle, either handing this off to John Griffin in the parking department or coming back before you to take you through a very detailed set of projections on how that model plays out. But long story short, um, he, we're already in year one, fiscal 2024, so some of these initiatives are already in place or in play moving forward. And if uh, all of these initiatives go through as currently planned, uh, you are looking at a parking system that can meet its requirements, but with very little um, net cash flow. I believe at the end of the year, if everything falls right, after uh, they've met all of their operating expenses and the, re and the commitment to donate to the Downtown Improvement Fund, um, you've got about $18,000 left at the end. So it is sustainable, but it's certainly not a profit generator by any means. Um, as we looked forward to the following year, there was um, an even greater number of initiatives that were coming through. Uh, again, if you remember, one of the things we said was that we wanted to for forward fund all, any of our improvements. So in year one, uh, any improvements were covered with the existing budget in year two. Uh, we tried to forward fund that by um, making adjustments to some of the different permit rates and meter rates here in order to uh, create that revenue stream necessary to cover the cost of uh, the staff and materials that we're going to have to be handing and bringing on in order to perform the work that the parking system does. Uh, this scenario or this concept also includes um, scheduled contributions back to offset 
uh, debt service on the system. I know that the improvements to the two garages are going to be about an eight million dollar price tag, and or much higher than that. <laughs> and so, uh, what we wanted to do was factor in what the fund could contribute back to help offset that, as well as the establishment of the sinking fund for major repair and replacement going out, uh, going forward. And then um, the plan is also to increase. Um, on a regular basis, the contribution to the Downtown Improvement Fund so that they can continue uh, to do their good work. This is in sort of the core of best practices for downtown parking systems and that states some of the money that is brought in from parking operations should be reinvested into the community, either in beautification, events, or something along those lines. In this case, the mechanism for that is the Downtown Improvement Fund. Uh, under best case scenario, with all of those adjustments, uh, we are looking at a um, we are looking at a positive NOI and after contributions uh, to the debt service uh, debt service fund of about one hundred fifty thousand contributions to sinking fund of about one hundred fifty thousand and downtown improvement fund of one hundred thirty five, which is up about ten thousand dollars from the prior year we're left with a net cash flow of $60,000, uh, which could go toward um, either further uh, allocations um, for other things or meeting capital needs going forward. Uh, going into year three, um, most of the contributions uh, or most of the changes we're looking at are um, primarily on the uh, expense side here, um, doing further investment to improve technology and services out of the parking department or make improvements to the parking system. Um, this is um, conceptually the time where the city might want to consider uh, going over to automated and gated operation of the two existing parking garages. Uh, one, because it would create greater efficiencies. Two, it would free up uh, the parking enforcement personnel to hire better uses. Uh, I think we talked in an earlier working, working session this evening about some of those different hire and better uses and how they might serve. So this is sort of tied into that prior conversation here. Uh, going forward, again, uh, we're showing a positive on the NOI which after plan contributions to offset debt service, contribute to the sinking fund, contribute to the downtown improvement fund, leaves a small net cash flow at the end of the day, which is the objective that you're looking for um, from a self-sustaining system. If we can go to year four, please. Yeah. <laughs> Notable things that are really coming out of year four include <clears throat> Uh, and things that I just wanted to highlight would include things like um, starting to really go forward with a whole scale replacement of the existing meters and kiosks that are will at this point become uh, outdated and they are starting to reach the end of their service life. Uh, also looking at the possibility of uh, potentially expanding um, the scope of services the parking department uh, engages in to improve their ability to enforce parking policy. Um, of course, continuing to contribute to debt service and sinking fund, downtown improvement fund, um, really starting to look in terms of bringing in EV, uh, electrical vehicle charging infrastructure into the public lots and garages. This is anticipated to be the year uh, where the electric vehicle fleet in private ownership could well uh, meet or exceed 15% of the total rolling stock. So this is a good time to start thinking about turning your parking garages and parking lots into filling stations as, as well as parking facilities. Um, and then also looking at possibly making some of the recommended changes to uh, zoning. Um, this is also the time to probably start looking at uh, where you could put in additional parking supply either at the north end or the south end of downtown. And because at this point you're going to be butting up at the end of the short term. 
Uh, you'll still have available capacity in the system, but that will get exhausted in the midterm. So being able to start uh, at least the search design and feasibility study processes put you in good place to break ground the following year uh, to start developing those assets if all the development goes through as proposed. In year five, um, nothing uh, fantastic here. Again, this is a continuation of the investment uh, in staffing and equipment to allow the parking department to um, deliver their services. Uh, one of the things that um, we would hope had occurred at this point was um, a final and very clear definition for the mission for the parking department and also preparation and circulation of an annual report from the parking department to go out not only to the Boulder, Board of Aldermen but the general public as well to provide that transparency and let them know all of the things that their uh, parking dollars are actually doing or realized uh, back in the community as benefit. Um, at this point in time, again, the NOI has dropped um, significantly from where it's been the two prior years here. Um, you may be looking at a much lower sinking fund contribution because uh, if you're continuing to contribute to debt service and you're continuing an improvement uh, in, in a, uh, increasing contribution to downtown improvement fund, uh, your net cash flow at that point is down to about $3,000. In the long term, once we go by beyond this five-year plan here, um, there are a whole scope of things that you can do and, and I'm sure if you've even skimmed the document, uh, skim the report, you can see that uh, there's a lot of different initiatives that are still on the table at that point. Um, these run the gamut. Could be anything from creating new parking structures, uh, looking at further investments in technology that would actually give people real-time information on parking availability within the public parking system or would help augment wayfinding. So as folks came into town, they could literally find, <coughs> follow, um, signs that would take them directly to the first available parking space and some of the different assets. Um, looking at creating a uh, service center for the parking department where people could actually walk in and ask questions, do things uh, face to face. That's happening right now on an informal basis, but we would potentially be at the place where we could start doing that on a very formal and fixed basis. Um, certainly looking at amping up the communications programming uh, so the general public is aware of what their parking and transportation options are moving forward. Uh, potentially looking at developing a public-private facility. Um, continuing to improve security um, in the facilities through both active and passive measures. Uh, and continuing and expanding contributions to the sinking and downtown improvement funds. Now, that's all great. The one thing or one caveat that I want to leave this Board of Aldermen with is because of the commitment to forward funding, as you start to look at this stuff at this point in time, um, you're going to have to also look at the income stream within the parking system and probably make some decisions as to whether or not that needs augmentation in order to support some of these initiatives moving forward. So you've got one rate adjustment, which is well overdue at this point and necessary just to allow uh, the, the rates to do uh, what they're supposed to do in terms of behavior modification and influencing, you may be at some point looking at a future rate adjustment uh, in order to continue to meet the requirements of the system being self-sustaining forward funding. Um, I spent some time within the report talking about the different mechanisms that other communities uh, have used in order to authorize this going forward and really inform the public and engage them in that process because nobody has ever heard I'm going to increase parking rates. And like, um, so there are some suggestions as to how you could structure that going forward to make that a little bit more pal palatable and a little bit more predictable. Um, but uh, that is 361 pages and hopefully less than 30 minutes. <coughs> 
Alderman Clay. I, I'm sure that you, you did explain it, but I was going through so many pages that I probably missed it. Could you explain what the sinking fund is again? So the sinking fund would be a regular contribution into what is hopefully some sort of interest bearing fund um, that can be drawn against for major repair and replacement in the future. For example, if I could travel back in time to when the Elm Street garage and the High Street garage were built, I would tell Jill's predecessor to start taking $50 of space for each one of those and putting them into a fund um, so that uh, 40 years from now, when you bring in an appraiser and they take a look at those and say, you're going to have to spend $8 million or more, you actually have a significant amount of that already in hand. You're not looking to go out and incur debt for that. You're not looking at having to rob another program in order to pay for that, take it out of the general fund. You actually have that money in hand because you've set it aside strategically as you go forward. Mm -hmm. Follow up? Yes. So yeah. I, I can look at the sinking fund as like an enterprise fund or a, um, um, a savings, savings kind of account type of. Saving, yeah, savings account I think is probably the best way to describe an enterprise fund. Right. At least as I understand it's a slightly different yeah. animal. So, but there was one year, I don't know if it was year five or <coughs> so, I'm not even going to try to go back to it, um, that you, you didn't have anything in that. Are yeah. you saying within five years we would? have a su significant amount sitting in that account that we would draw from or we would have no more need to draw from it, which doesn't oh, make no, sense. Oh, no, no. I mean, you would have made reg regular contributions up to that point. And depending, again, the thing with financial forecasting, we lay out all the assumptions that these are the things that are going to happen. Um, you could you could have a massive development come into downtown that feeds much more volume than I ever anticipated and your contributions could be much higher. Um, the thing that's most important for the Board of Aldermen to understand as they look through this plan and consider adopting this as a guiding document um, is that there is going to be price tags and benefits for each decision that are made and you, you have to consider both of those and where they land on the balance sheet. Um, you can't take all the good stuff and not consider some of the other stuff as well. Thank you. Further questions, Alderman Sullivan. Thank you. A uh, few specific questions. <clears throat> Just from the parking study, how do you enforce time limited parking so you can only park there for 30 minutes? I mean, how do you do that? It's very difficult. Um, it's very difficult to enforce time limits any th for anything less than an hour. And an hour is very labor intensive. If you consider you've got one block face that's got 14 spaces on it, and they've got an hour time limit, you've got to send somebody up and down that block every hour in order to check those plates and see if they're mm -hmm. compliant with the posted time limit. Mm -hmm. um, it's not unusual to see municipalities adapt or adopt 30 minute time limits, 15 minute time limits. Um, those are usually in response to a special request. Um, they certainly feel better and look better to the folks who are making requests in terms of feasibility of enforcement. Uh, it's a very tough sell. There is technology out there uh, that will actually allow you to enforce those now, but in the state of New Hampshire, uh, it's not allowable at this point. Follow up, please. Oh, uh, yep. Uh, after this, we're going to review the circulation study, and, and I'm going to take something from there and apply it to this. I think I read in the circulation study that it was forecasted that the year that they did it, that the number of cars, car traffic, was not e was was considerably less pre-pandemic 2019. Right. And they did not anticipate that to return until the year 2030. Wasn't sure if you were aware of that when you were doing the study, if that was something that you can take into account, the fact that we were only using 50% of our spaces because the car traffic downtown was not equal to what it was not three or four years earlier. So, so and I'll, I'll let 
VHB speak to this as well here, but they're actually two different animals. Traffic generation is vehicles moving through an area, mm. and um, as is kind of common knowledge, Main Street is often used as a supplement or an alternative to um, the every turnpike for moving north and south here. You can have um, you're going to have a lot more, a lot fewer cars move through an area and not necessarily influence I see. parking. In okay. Um, one of the reasons that we initiated this uh, process in uh, March of 2020 but didn't really get going in data collection until the fall of 2021 mm -hmm. was so that we could wait for a lot of the COVID impacts to stabilize and base our recommendations on what we felt was a more stabilized and representative um, level of demand. Uh, that's also why we, we went out and did supplemental counts in uh, early 22, okay. is because we knew that the market was steadily recovering and changing and evolving. Okay. I have one more follow-up, please. Follow-up. The resolution that's in front of us says that we, by voting in favor, says that we accept this study. Should I assume that the forward funding plan that you put in front of us, which this alderman agrees with, that by voting yes for this resolution, we have given it the stamp of approval that the, we are recommending to the city that we move ahead with the forward funding business model for city parking? Yes. Okay. Director Cummings, do you have anything to? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. For the record, Tim Cummings, Director of Administrative Services. You're absolutely correct. What I think uh, you, you should um, think about over the next steps is adopting this plan uh, would be uh, advisory and would help inform staff uh, that you're in general agreement with uh, uh, the direction that we're going. But follow-on separate pieces of legislation are going to be necessary uh, to actually execute on this plan. Uh, one of them, first and foremost, the time-sensitive one, is uh, moving towards an enterprise fund. We have uh, set internally a goal of trying to get that done this year, and we're going into budget season. That would be the first uh, piece of legislation that would come before you, um, and we want to make sure that we're moving in the appropriate direction. So, uh, uh, Alden Sullivan, hopefully I'm answering your question. Sure. Um, but it's going to be three to five, could be more than five, separate pieces of legislation as we look to uh, amend and tweak and adopt the various ordinances on our books to conform with the uh, the comprehensive plan that you saw this evening. Follow up. <laughs> Sorry, but uh, Director Cummings, that is, those are kind of bigger pieces of legislation, not the minute uh, changes in city code that we need to make for our for the parking that that the city that the study outlines. I mean, there were several in there. That, that's not what you're talking about there. It, it, it goes hand in glove, so some of the more minute measures will be bundled into larger pieces of legislation okay. that will tackle whole chunks, okay. operations, revenue, expenses, you know, three big buckets. Uh, how we regulate uh, enforcement, uh, those would be the types of uh, moving vehicles, the parliamentary moving vehicle, the piece of legislation that may, you know, have itemized four or five items within that one piece of legislation. Okay, thanks. Further questions, members of the board? Seeing none, I'll, I'll them and click. Uh, thank you. Um, actually, Director Cummings, don't, don't necessarily sit down. I, I just have a, a quick question. Um, um, adding on to what uh, um, Alderman Sullivan had said. So the, um, the recommendations of the fees and so on, that we, we saw here, they would go as as is, or is that the tweaking that you were talking about? Um, so so of increasing it even more, or not that not that we would, but I'm just so right now this would be this is like non-binding, just guidance to right. us. Um, separate piece of legislation would be necessary. We would use this document as a guideline for developing okay, right. that piece of legislation. That separate piece of legislation. 
uh, would be laid before you and you could you know, act upon it as you wish. Um, that would be for the increasing of fines, meter rates, whatever the case may be. But everything is, is interconnected because um, you need to raise the rates to be able to have a self-sustaining enterprise fund. So the, sep the enterprise fund may be a separate piece of legislation um, but I, I, I would recommend that you, you understand and know in totality what the revenue and the expenses are because the, the creation of the enterprise fund is really the framework for uh, executing on the type of parking service the city would like. Thank, thank you. May, may I just make a comment? Quick comment, please. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, no, I, I, I'm complete, completely agree with, with all, of, of, all of this. Um, I just didn't know if by agreeing to this, because it did say guidance, if our hands were tied to the exact wordage that was in there. Um, I, I am all for this, I give it a big thumbs up. So um, that, that wasn't my question, I just really wanted to know if our hands were tied to it, but each piece will come and we can tweak it as necessary, thank you. Further questions, members of the committee? Seeing none, I'll call for a vote. All those are favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. And if we can, one more, I see in the wings, we have Mr. Dan uh, Hudson, city engineer. So I think this will be relatively quick. So if uh, without this exemption, uh, exception, we'll have. Uh, 24? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mr. Uh, Hudson, are you? Do you want me to make the motion first? Yes, yeah, yeah, there he is. Up. Okay, <laughs> could you make the motion, please? Yes, um, I motion to recommend approval of R-24-009, authorizing release of certain stormwater easements and restrictions. Okay, uh, Mr. Hudson, you want to give us a brief explanation? Mm -hmm. Sure, uh, for the record, Dan Hudson, city engineer. Um, so when Bronstein, the former Bronstein development was redeveloped, um, some of the stormwater treatment measures were changed. Uh, developments in Nashua need to comply with the stormwater ordinances, which require kind of a blanket easement over the property, uh, which say that the owners of the development will uh, maintain their devices, um, and, and uh, that sort of thing also enables the city, should there be uh, issues with any discharges uh, that would put us in jeopardy for our MS4 permit, that we can uh, come onto the property and assess those, that sort of thing. This proposed uh, change <coughs> is basically taking the previous uh, stormwater documents and replacing them with new ones because the development has been reconfigured um, and the document should reflect the current configuration and ownership. Be happy. Okay, discussion. Seeing none, I'll call for a vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. And now, could the clock bid go back to the regular agenda, please? <laughs> Uh, Mr. Chairman, I motion to recommend approval for R-24-006 relative to the acceptance of 2022-2023 Downtown Nashville Circulation Study for use as guidance in planning and future decision making. Okay. Uh, Director Cummings, could you give us an overview, please? Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, I actually have a PowerPoint, and if I may approach, uh, I'd like to join you this evening. I have. Uh, Director Sullivan with me and our consultant from VHB, Please Chris. Please invite them up and uh, actually we might have you run the show because do it I, seems like a PowerPoint. Do, on I have the, do I have the PowerPoint here? Uh, I think Director Sullivan told me he turned it off, so I think I need to reload it. I'll take, I'll take a look right now. I don't see it Tim on the phone. Up, sir. I don't know. I so brought my thumb drive. Right. And I'm going to take a brief. So can uh, you yes. automatically can you uh, yes. run oh, things? Right. I'll be right okay. back, please. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, we, we can go to a desk. Well, I would have to can put it on this computer, yeah. so I don't have it on there. OK, gotcha. Yeah, just put it in. Put it on the desktop if you can. Yeah. yeah. 
that way if I have to go back and forth again. Well, I'm just leaving the slides. Who's this? The problem was I can't freeze it. I'm going to pull the thing. No, it just kept freezing yeah. on every single page, even when I tried to do it as a slide. Who's right. this? Yeah, this is Andy. Yeah, there you go. We're in recess, right? Yeah. I might tell me to start running it, but we'll do this first. It'd be nice just to put it on PDF. Yeah. If you have the sheets, let's do them out when we have a sheet before. Yeah. Okay. That's not good. Where's the PDF? Is it on the app? Uh, That's what Matt said. Huh? That's what Matt said. What's up? That's wallpaper I had in my grandmother's house. Turn, turn, turn of the century wallpaper. You're taking away my joke. Gonna... <laughs> that's what I was going to say. That's what Matt said to me earlier today. This is done in PowerPoint 95. <laughs> it's awesome. Hey, this is up for a... Actually, I think it was circa 2014. It might be 2011. Director Cummings, if you want to get started. I... We ready to go? Yeah. All right, thank you, uh, uh, Madam uh, or Clerk. My name's, Tim, <laughs> my name's Tim Cummings. I'm the Director of Administrative Services. And uh, this evening, we're here looking for a similar type of confirmation um, that you just provided relative to the, to the parking study. We are here this evening looking for just general guidance on um, on the downtown circulation as we proceed and move forward with various plans and studies and, and more, more specifically designs where we could be potentially spending a, a, lot, of, a lot of money uh, on designing something. We want to just ensure we're on the right trajectory. And so um, we uh, did a study um, uh, starting back in, in um, 2015. Can you give me the Can I? Do this again? Is it doing it? No, nothing. Mouse <clears> moving <throat> around. Oh, there it is. Oh, sorry. Slide. <laughs> well, if you just you back. You can see it here. If you back one. Yeah, there we go. So that was the, that was a downtown circulation study done by BHB. Chris, our consultant from BHB, is here with us this evening. If any specific questions arise, um, but uh, uh, next slide. Uh, it was um, started in earnest actually in 2011 and uh, really got going in 2013. It all centered around uh, the Broad Street Parkway, now known as the Veterans Memorial Parkway. And then the idea of how we were going to connect or link the volume of traffic that was west of downtown into the downtown and ensure that we had an orderly flow of traffic. And so uh, we, we, we had a big study effort that occurred in 2014. Uh, and then ultimately, the report that I just referenced a second ago developed in, in 2015 uh, time frame. So during that time, um, there was some, some main directives or guidance that, that was given. And so the downtown circulation study was intended and associated goals to identify potential strategies to improve roadway and intersection traffic flow with regards to mobility in the downtown area, strengthen pedestrian, bicycle, transit connections, you know, essentially ensure that we have multimodal type of, type of mindset and then enhance the accessibility for, for residents and businesses. And again, ensuring that we have that east to west type of connectivity. And so um, the next slide, the next uh, slides will essentially outline the major takeaways that came about in the 2015 
uh, uh, study. One, the Walnut Street Oval, and ensuring that that Walnut Street Oval was, was converted in a way that was more pedestrian friendly. Water Street, the idea of Water Street was to make it more pedestrian friendly um, and try to entice development in and around the riverfront. Factory Street, looking to, to repurpose Factory Street to be pedestrian friendly, uh, but then also maybe potentially making it uh, two-way traffic flow. West Pearl Street, again, making it two-way traffic mm -hmm. flow, uh, but essentially uh, trying to create the connectivity from the west down what was the Broad Street Parkway on and through into the downtown area and continuing on through into Hudson. And then Spring Street, the idea of making Spring Street uh, two-way co connectivity. Next slide. <clears throat> Temple Street and East Pearl Street, again, making that two-way uh, type, of, uh, type of flow. Uh, and this would be the counter uh, balance to the reversal of West Pearl Street. If the traffic wasn't gonna go down East Pearl Street, it would be uh, uh, to the west, it would be shifted to Factory Street. Then there were some smaller elements that were also uh, contemplated in the study. Court Street and Park Street reconfiguring those streets to, uh, again, accommodate more of a flow and, and to try to disperse traffic uh, more, more easily through, through the downtown. And then uh, the concept of implementing concurrent and leading pedestrian intervals. And so this is a concept where um, to gain more capacity, if necessary, in your throughput of traffic flow, you might be able to change the way you're uh, uh, having pedestrians cross the street. Um, something that we haven't imp instituted yet here in the city of Nashua, but it is something that uh, was, was studied and recommended in the 2015 study. So in 2015, we took a lot of what was said and we started to, uh, can you go back? Uh, there you go. So we started to, to <laughs> implement a lot of what was suggested, a lot of, a lot of what was articulated, um, but we didn't, um, uh, proceed to one have actually this type of conversation where we got a policy document uh, you know uh, instituted to give us clear direction um, but also we wanted to update the study to discuss what we had more recently contemplated in 2000 and in uh, 19 2020 time frame which was having West Pearl Street and then more factory Street be one-way reversals and so in VHB in 2019 uh, reviewed the, the, the work that was done in 2015 and, and came back and preliminarily <laughs> said, yes, it works. You could uh, reverse West Pearl Street to be one way, going in the opposite direction. You could then look to reverse Temple Street or Factory Street to be the counterweight to that and have that continue on up through the, the Walnut Street Oval uh, and then on to um, uh, eventually the, bar the Broad Street Parkway via, via Central Street. Um, so um, we, since that time, started to look at Main Street a little differently. And uh, COVID-19 hit, and then we started to reduce our Main Street for various reasons. Uh, to ma mainly entertain and uh, execute a lot of what we've heard even earlier this evening about accommodating multimodal, uh, pedestrian-friendly streetscapes. And so we did that as a temporary measure um, in, in, you know, in the most recent years, but the study that was done in 2015 didn't necessarily contemplate that. So um, particularly um, uh, Engineer Hudson, who's with us this evening, participating via Zoom, and Director Sullivan, uh, under their guidance, they said that they wanted to take a step back, make sure we were taking a holistic approach. When we, we do our due diligence, ensure we're acting in good, good order for the city. And so they reached out to VHB and they asked VHB to uh, update the study again with the new variable being in integrated that uh, <coughs> if the city so chose, and that is not the conversation we need to have this evening, uh, but it is something we want to ensure that we had good data on, which is if we were to permanently reduce um, uh, the capacity of Main Street by instituting some of the um, uh, multimodal concepts that uh, are in our imagined Nashua master plan, we wanted to ensure that we had the, uh, the data behind uh, us to, to make some uh, uh, observations and ultimately some recommendations to this body and to other bodies 
should this um, uh, community decide to endeavor in that direction. Uh, so that was what was studied most recently. And so um, as you can see, we have some elements of design underway and we are actually getting ready to go to construction on some other projects like um, uh, Water Street, um, West Pearl Street, Factory Street, um, Walnut Street Oval is a little less, uh, not as far uh, in their design and they've just started with the Walnut Street Oval conversion. We haven't even discussed or touched Spring Street or some of these other elements and we thought it was a good time to come before you to basically reassess. Press pause, make sure that we're um, traveling uh, in, the, in the right direction um, and we're continuing to, to move forward in, in good in good working order. Can you uh, skip ahead to uh, a couple slides? Okay, so this is the real uh, uh, um, thrust of what I want to discuss this evening, is really ensuring that we have uh, an understanding that there is agreement with the downtown circulation study. And so we, we developed this map, and ultimately the guidance we're seeking this evening is yes, there is uh, agreement that folks would like to see Spring Street go two-way. Folks would like to see West Pearl Street reversed and Factory Street reversed. And so there's that um, uh, <coughs> reversal that occurs for better connectivity from, from the west to the east. Squaring off the Wall Street uh, Oval so it's pedestrian friendly. And then we've already started and we're very well down the path of Water Street. So we're reversing Water Street. We're making it more pedestrian friendly. And it, you know that was the project that probably got out the gate the fastest, and uh, we're going to go under construction with that in the spring, and that was all necessitated with the riverfront plan. So, um, out of all the slides this evening that you're seeing, this is the one slide that I ask that you you, you really hone in on, and that you you kind of take away this evening is focusing on this slide because uh, it is the most important. Uh, next slide. May, may I make a comment? Sure. Um, the previous uh, presentation, this presentation, will go to Donna, correct, for the, yes. for the yeah. minutes so yep. that we all have them. Thank you. Then. Yep. So uh, the question was is, um, would the narrowing of Main Street um, still make the 2018 <coughs> recommendations uh, applicable? And the answer was yes. And so uh, <coughs> we wanted to, to look that, and we wanted to ensure that we had a good understanding as to what that potentially would mean. And so I'm, I've asked Director Sullivan to uh, present some of the concepts that were uh, adopted in the Imagine Nashua Master Plan, uh, which the following slides will show. Well, thank you, Director Cummins. Mr. Chair, if I, I may, Matt Sullivan, Community Development Director for the City of Nashua. And before I briefly comment on the next slide, which will be a, a review of the Imagine Nashua concepts I know several of you are familiar with, and we'll do a reacclimation to those this evening, I wanted to just note uh, Relative to the previous diagram that Director Cummings emphasized is perhaps the most important visual that you'll see this evening. Uh, I want to be clear that not all of these component projects or elements of this uh, downtown circulation map are fully designed by any means. And so when you consider these different elements this evening, I want it to be very clear both for you and for members of the public, and I'll speak to the Walnut Street Oval perhaps in just a moment, that we're very early in the process for actually laying out what these improvements will look like the extent to which they uh, interact with vehicle traffic, pedestrians, bicycles, but certainly those uh, core principles apply across all the projects. But I just want to be very clear that when we talk about reversals, we talk about different road diets along Main Street, the extent to which that's going to be done, what the specific design will look like, that has not yet been decided. This is to understand and get support for the broad principles of what's represented here on this diagram. And I think Director Cummings spoke to that, but I want to quickly emphasize that. So if we could go perhaps to uh, this slide right here, again, I feel a bit like I've done perhaps what I would refer to as a bit of a dog and pony show on the imagined national plans, particularly for Main Street and for the Amherst Street Corridor and DW Corridor. But I wanted to take a moment to emphasize, uh, and I'll borrow a term from earlier this evening, this sort of complete streets-esque layout that was proposed as part of the imagined national plan and was ultimately uh, not only, I think, brought forward by staff as part of that process, but really came from a grassroots conversation uh, with different stakeholders in the downtown area, what they were seeing in other communities like Concord, like Portsmouth, uh, like those that they really cherished in the, in the region, 
this is really uh, this type of design that incorporates bicycles, pedestrians, greenery, uh, sort of uh, third places for individuals to congregate and enjoy the public realm in a, in a larger area. Albeit, but to still allow traffic to pass is really what the Imagine National Plan laid out through this goal of uh, achieving some level of improvements along the Main Street corridor. To emphasize a few specific recommendations, and I'll read these verbatim for the record, but one of the specific recommendations was to facilitate public realm expansion improvement on Main Street uh, and to maintain the downtown's commercial activity, particularly along sections with active retail and restaurant frontages, and to create ample space for seating areas and or small plazas. Uh, as many of you are familiar, we have currently authorization to continue extended outdoor dining for this upcoming summer. That's a conversation I expect will emerge over the coming 18 months or so as to what happens beyond that. But I think from staff's perspective and certainly from the conversations with the board, while there are some, there's some level of discourse around this idea, I think there's generally support for reimagining what the Main Street looks like to be more accommodating to these alternative modes and to generally making it a more attractive place for a variety of users, including, of course, those who wish to stop to shop, those who wish to traverse the corridor for recreational activities, those who wish to simply enjoy the space um, for, for their Saturday morning activity. We're pretty clear, at least at this point in time, that that remains a primary objective for Main Street, and that's one of the reasons why we acted deliberately to ensure that the update to the downtown circulation study accounted for some level of what we referred to in front of this committee and others as a road diet of Main Street. Uh, so that's the concept that we've tried to move forward with the downtown circulation update and we'll certainly be bringing forward to you as part of uh, additional conversations in the future. Uh, moving forward to the next slide, just to further emphasize some of the, uh, what, the, what the progress has been on this thus far, you may recall that uh, as part of the American Recovery Plan uh, allocation that the city received, uh, this, the Board of Aldermen actually agreed to authorize for communication the allocation of $250,000 for a concept design of Main Street. Uh, we're in the process of working through how exactly to go about uh, leading that redesign, but one thing has been done as an interim measure led by Engineer Hudson, the team at the uh, Division of Public Works, and that is to actually develop uh, a few multimodal concepts for the downtown area that reflect the principles of the Imagine National Master Plan, but are actually more reflective of the on the ground conditions that we have along Main Street. And so I'm not gonna go through these in detail uh, this evening, but perhaps uh, if the clerk would maybe just flip through the next few slides, I wanna show you a variety of concepts here. And the colors are a bit difficult to read in the bottom left hand corner but showing different proposed layouts of uh, dedicated bike lines, sidewalks, dining areas, parking reconfiguration potentially that may occur with Main Street, and certainly the travel way. And I know there's been a lot of discussion about the narrowing of the travel way, and we'll talk a little bit about that in just a few minutes here. But all of these concepts reflect, all these concepts reflect some reconfiguration of that center traveled way, uh, and nearly all of them reflect uh, conversion of two lanes in each direction down to one lane, albeit with a center turning lane or some alternative. And so we bring this, uh, we brought this up as, as part of this conversation, something to say that we are advancing that concept and it only uh, emphasizes the criticality of, of uh, accounting for that Main Street road diet in some form as part of the circulation update that was undertaken over the last year. Lastly, I'll just close with two comments from the Imagine National Plan that I think reiterate the criticality of, of this work in the downtown along Main Street. Uh, it was clear that the recommendations spoke to expanding the sidewalk into certain areas where there was on-street on parking. We recognize that won't be done in all areas and that parking may need to be uh, reconfigured. But also it was clear that there may need to be a need to shrink or remove existing lanes in order to accommodate some of this preferred design. Again, we have not done full design of the corridor. I don't want to represent that in any way, shape, or form. I mean only to say that this downtown circulation study and the data included and the conclusions included herein are able to accommodate a narrowing of Main Street in one way, shape, or form. And I want to remind this group uh, of the work that's been done to date. Uh, if we could move to the next slide. So um, the reason why we're here this evening is, and as, as Director Sullivan has said, and I'm going to say right now, we haven't start, started any type of design but we are getting to a point where there are some needs for design to occur, particularly on the, the Walnut Street Oval. And so we just want to make sure we are acting in good interest to what we have heard 
over the last decade from this community, this has not been something that has developed overnight, but it's something that has been discussed with me in particular repeatedly uh, over the years is we want to have a circulation of the downtown that uh, as, as illustrated in the BHB study. And so um, I believe it would be good to have follow-on conversations about Main Street. We know Main Street can be accommodated. Uh, but, you know, we want to make sure that the flow of traffic and the circulation is still meeting uh, the interest uh, to, to you all this evening. And that's why we are, we are here. The slide before you shows how the westerly flow uh, could be uh, proposed to the east which shows how the connectivity from Central down on through to Temple could be achieved. It shows the squaring off of the quote unquote Walnut Street Oval that um, we are actively in the midst of needing to start design on and everything uh, is a triggering event. When we start that, we should really start to look at the West Pearl Street uh, connection as well as uh, the Factory Street connection we are, uh, why are we starting that design, you may ask. It's because we are actually in receipt of uh, both state and federal funds for this project. Um, and uh, we, we are uh, currently needing to start design. Uh, next slide. Shows the reversal and its counterbalance to that reversal, which is the Temple Street on through factory and how you'd connect on back up to the, uh, to, to, to the parkway. Uh, again, just as a, as, as a countermeasure. And a big element that I wanted to point out and one of the reasons why it drove a lot of the conversation is because connecting people from the parkway more easily to the Elm Street garage was something that was very much of interest um, and one of the reasons why we were, we were looking to pursue the reversal of, of West Pearl Street. Now, um, as uh, Director Sullivan had indicated, um, all this can be accomplished um, uh, with the uh, narrowing of Main Street, if that's uh, uh, something we so uh, endeavor to do. The VHB, and, and Chris is here this evening, can, can talk a little bit more about it. Next slide. Um, there are other tools in our toolbox that we can actually use to even gain more capacity on Main Street if we were looking to uh, implement some of these uh, more um, uh, innovative uh, uh, smart growth concepts. And so, Chris, could you talk us a little bit about this slide here? Yeah, uh, thank you. And once again, uh, Chris Bobe, Project Manager, VHB out of Bedford, New Hampshire. So uh, as it exists today along Main Street and predominantly through Nashville and actually prominently throughout New England, although it has been changing mm -hmm. over time, uh, is the use of the exclusive pedestrian phase where a pedestrian hits the button, all traffic stops. All pedestrians from both movements, whether north, south, east, or west, enter the crosswalks to make their maneuver, whether there's one, whether there's somebody on every crosswalk. Um, what it does not prohibit, though, is if you have right turns um, that could go on red to cross against there, entering a conflict point, although the intention is on the exclusive pedestrian phases, that it, and this is at signalized intersections, that the pedestrians have control of the intersection to make their maneuvers from uh, one corner to another. Uh, back as far as 1996, I was here uh, in front of the Board of Aldermen talking about um, what is predominant throughout the United States, and that's the concurrent pedestrian phases, where the pedestrians move concurrent with vehicular traffic. Uh, uh, but often what happens there is that you have the pedestrians looking at the turning vehicles or the vehicles that are going, and it's even though state law yield to pedestrians in the crosswalk, you get the walk signal, you have the right of way. It's usually, uh, well, is this person gonna turn within my path? And it's something that isn't the New England way. You know, but um, as New England continues to grow, um, it, we, it com becomes capacity constrained in intersections and there's a need for tools in a toolbox. And the new tool that's out there is what was called the leading pedestrian interval. And that's very similar to an exclusive pedestrian crossing where there is a period of time when the walk is up three to four seconds, it could go up to seven seconds, that the pedestrians enter the crosswalk and then the vehicle, uh, the, you know, it, it moves adjacent with the vehicular traffic. So if it's east-west traffic, it's the east-west movement. 
so the pedestrians would enter the crosswalk, be in the crosswalk, then the signal goes green. When you have that predominant through traffic, then that through traffic moves concurrent with the pedestrians. Pedestrians complete their phase. The pedestrians are now visual and within that crosswalk uh, with vehicular traffic yielding to them. This increases the, um, the throughput of vehicles if necessary. I wanna make it clear, this isn't something that uh, within the study is, is being recommended. It is something, as uh, Director Cummings had uh, alluded to, that this is a tool within the toolbox. So that if the city does go down the path of changing some of the circulation or restricting two lanes on uh, four lanes section there on Main Street to a single lane in each direction, and you see um, capacity or congestion problems occurring, you're like, what do we do now? Well, this is the tool within the toolbox, and it's something that NHDOT, the New Hampshire Department of Transportation, has adopted as primarily the leading pedestrian interval. You're going to see it more predominantly throughout New Hampshire, and is just something that uh, to bring up once again in front of this board. As I said, this is my third decade in talking about this. And, and I understand uh, wholeheartedly why maybe this board decades ago would shy away from, from this idea. I mean, if you think about our current roads and the way they're designed, um, it could be a little scary. Uh, but on the flip side, if we are going to narrow our main street and redesign it, um, like the way I, I would recommend that, that you should, um, the road will be much different. And, and, and when that road is different, crossing that road won't be as scary. And so moving towards concepts like this, um, are very achievable. As Chris had mentioned, it's happening uh, across the country. And Chris, is there a municipality here in the state that has actually done this? Yeah, it's been, Concord has been for years, been moving forward on this. And I, I'll be honest with you, I'll, I'll be, when they first went from their exclusive pedestrian phases to full concurrent, that's not putting the pedestrians out there, but the walk comes up along with the green. It was difficult for the city. And this was about a decade ago when they went to this. Uh, but now it, it's becoming more um, uh, readily recognized. And again, the leading pedestrian interval does give the pedestrians that feeling of safety to enter that crosswalk because nothing is moving while they're out there. Uh, and then generally and predominantly in the downtown areas, um, the vehicles yield to those pedestrians until they complete their movements, if you're turning. And again, vehicles that are the through traffic, which is the predominant flow on many of the movements in Main Street, um, continue to move simultaneously um, and adjacent to that, those pedestrian movements. So the point this evening is to, to you know, verify, to confirm, um, and, and ultimately look to seek uh, your approval. Um, we've done our due diligence. We understand that there's tools in the toolbox as necessary, but ultimately we want to ensure that we're marching in the right direction relative to, next slide, the, the general circulation uh, and reconfiguration of our, in our, of our downtown. So um, Water Street is already set to go with a reversal of Water Street. Next slide. Um, haven't started yet, but I have heard more often than not, this is one of the more popular things that has come across my desk, which is, can we please make Spring Street two-way? Um, and so um, it's something that is being continued to be recommended, and I just want to ensure we're in good stead uh, to move in this direction. You may be asking, why is this so important to us? It's because when we start design, it, for projects like this, we could be spending millions of dollars on design. Starts out with a couple hundred thousand dollars, and then it slowly goes to a million dollars and more than a million dollars when we actually enter construction. So we're just trying to ensure that we're doing uh, our due diligence before proceeding. Next slide. Uh, converting uh, the park and court streets to two-way to just help uh, vehicles move more differently and easily through the downtown. Next slide. And that's it. So uh, thank you. So um, again, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, if I could get the committee's favorable recommend recommendation this evening, I would, uh, I would greatly appreciate it. Okay, comments, members of the board, Alderman Clay. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Mr. Chairman. I just have a, a couple of quick comments. Um, I, I love the idea of, of as much pedestrian friendly as possible. It sounds like we're really working this way. To be honest with you, I had a constituent who contacted me and asked if Nashville could get rid of all their right turns on red. 
um, because of, <laughs> um, and I, I said, I, I, said I, could, I could say it, but I don't know how it happened. Um, I, and just so that you know, I'm, I'm going to be very open here. I'm all for this this plan. I think we need to move forward, and and, and I love the idea of the idea of it. Um, the the LPI, the, the one that you, you talked about with with that particular plan. My only concern is, um, but I did hear you say that that most of the time cars give to pedestrians. Not always. This is New England. No, but, not at all. <laughs> yeah, that's that's one of my concerns. Is that as you're, because I can see that you're both going there, someone could actually turn because they have the right to turn. And so it's going to take education mindset to the general public that a car can turn while you're in the, um, and, and that's my only concern about that, that LP, LPI. The thing about exclusive that's nice is you can go across. You can go diagonal. You don't have to go you know, <coughs> straight or forward. That's one of the nice things about when we do that. But remember, the design should be different, right? right. So when if so, so it needs to be hand in glove. So when the design uh, is done correctly, hopefully you're not encouraging turn lanes on your on your main street. That's just you know. Uh, and but then and then in addition to that, the vehicles should be moving slower. And that is really something that you you know the design should help encourage, and that with a technique or tool that Chris is talking about will bring about that safer environment uh, that will give confidence. And if I could expand upon uh, the use of the LPI, many municipalities, and you might see it in Concord, you might see it in, in Manchester as well if you've driven through there, that when that leading pedestrian interval is up, the walk is up, the pedestrians for that three to four seconds are entering the crosswalk, um, some, some municipalities are implementing a regulatory blank out sign. I don't know if you've got predominantly a, bu a bunch of those here in Nashville, but it's a dual use one where it actually comes up, no turn on red when the pedestrians are on there. And then as soon as it goes green and the countdown starts, it changes over to the R1015 sign, which is the, the diagrammatic of pedestrians yield, our vehicles yield to pedestrians in the crosswalk. So that has been, been being shown in conjunction with the leading pedestrian bill to be very effective. May I? Follow up. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I have seen, I, I was a state rep in Concord and I saw those signs regularly. So I, I, I do understand that. But I also have experienced the, um, in Concord, um, crossing the street and as I'm crossing, people are gonna turn down the side streets. It's just the way it's gonna happen, going slow or not. Um, and they have the mindset, well, I've got a green light, I can go. Why are you in the middle of the street kind of concept of it? That's the thing that, that concerns me about it. So even design, I think this is inevitable that could happen, but I think we can, we can work about it. I would not want to stop this for that. And if, if I may, I do have one other question. Um, when you talked about road diet, um, I love that, and I like the one lane on, on Main Street. Um, would we, is part of that considering putting a center lane like Concord has, where that's where the delivery trucks are? They're right in the middle there and, and they do their deliveries that way. Director Sullivan and I want to jump in to see, <laughs> but go ahead, I'll yield to Director <laughs> Sullivan. Uh, we, we don't know yet, uh, to, be, to be frank. I think we, you know, everything is on the table right now from diag diagonal park and, uh, parking of pedestrian, uh, passenger vehicles rather, to parallel spaces, to removal of parking. And that goes for the center turning lane option as well. Um, we haven't started to design. We haven't started to design. Okay. And I'm so that's in. not off the table. Center delivery truck areas yes. like they do have in Concord are certainly on the table as well. Um, but uh, that's certainly an option that we've looked at. It's included within those three diagrams that we shared that um, Engineer Hudson has been working on as well. Thank you. Uh, Alderman Lopez. Um, so I'm going to start by saying I'm also very much in support of this. So I don't want all my questions to be considered as not supportive. It's just it's the word that I am in representing. So I have specific concerns about those. Um, I grew up in Concord. So I've seen the difference between how they've developed their road dieting and multimodal transportation. And I think it would be great for more of that in Nashua as long as we can manage it in a way that you know, isn't confusing to the public. Um, so to that end, um, I know most of the studies that we've been doing probably uh, particularly on Spring Street predate um, the opening of the Spring Street shelter. It wasn't really fully online until early, if not mid-summer. 
So now you have a couple hundred people who are going from one location and joining a group of people going to the other location that that building is run by, which is on Quincy Street. And I have seen a lot of people going through the pathway along the Court Street. So to me, that suggests we want to watch where the pedestrians are in that area and make sure we put any kind of crossings or road design in position to account for that because we didn't do such a great job with that on the parkway. I know we weren't the ones doing it, but um, and it's taken us a, a couple years to figure out how to link where people are trying to enter on foot into Pine Street Extension where they might, we had thought they would cross a couple hundred feet down. So just a recommendation that we look at the pedestrian traffic um, there as well as obviously when church gets out. Uh, St. Patrick's has a, a wide variety of people, but there are a lot of older people that are crossing the street and they might need more time to get across the street to where they're parking. So just a suggestion there. Um, additionally, um, engaging people uh, in the oval, I've already talked to Director Sul Sullivan about this, but including the, some sort of forecasting of this is what we might do with Water Street um, and this is what we might do with the other um, is gonna be important because I think when we were contemplating all this stuff in the past, we didn't know that School, Street's flats, School Street Flats would be there. We didn't know there would be a lot more people uh, where Sullivan Terrace is. And all of those, those uh, places have people who are walking. And like all of the convenience stores are on the other side of Central Street. So we have to figure out where people are gonna cross safely for those two things either. I know those are probably considerations and this is part of what Director Cummings is uh, talking about for design. Um, I just wanted to bring them up. Um, I did have one question uh, asking Director Cummings to look into his crystal ball. Um, as we start doing all of this stuff, are we 100% sure we're not going to have to do any maintenance or renovations to the Main Street Bridge in the next five years? Oh, great, great, great question. Um, and, and I would say we will need to do uh, maintenance on the Main Street Bridge, and that will be contemplated and have to be part of the construction uh, if we were to proceed and move forward, and we would plan accordingly. Um, one in particular issue that we know uh, that we have to always be mindful of, uh, and I'll take the opportunity to, to, to reiterate it now, is the crossing of the utilities for the city of Nashua. The Nashua River divides the city in half, and making sure that we have the utilities uh, properly designed and crossing over is, is paramount. It's not something that folks think of, but uh, it's, it's vitally important. We're going to have to take all those things into consideration. Well, I know in this um, committee uh, a couple of years ago, Alderman O'Brien uh, made note of the fact that all, at the time, all of the fire alarm signaling boxes were going under there, and we sort of spread them out under the parkway so that it wouldn't be all in one box. But I think my last thought is that the work we might have to do on the bridge would also be a very good argument for implementing a road diet sooner rather than later so that it isn't so disruptive when we have to do the necessary work. Thank you. Other questions, Alderman Sullivan? Thank you very much. I, I looked through the study. Uh, I, I, I'm not against it, but there are some things that I want to get out on the record. And the very, I think it's one of the first sentences that, where, where it says a very positive declarative statement basically says that the evaluation, the, the evaluation for the feasibility of a permanent road diet on Main Street based on the success of the seasonal uh, feature that has the city seeking a permanent road diet solution. I'm not breaking any news here. This is a very, this is a big hot button issue in the city about road closures and, and shrinking Main Street for the seasonal outdoor dining. I can also look into my crystal ball that says, this is a three year resolution. If this happens, that goes away because now it's permanent. So the thing is, is that I just wanna get that out on the record. I'm not saying that, that this is unsuccessful, but I haven't seen any data to the contrary that says it was successful. So that, that, that's something that's in the study that I took exception to because I just haven't seen anything that says this was a thumbs up all around. So, so, so may I clarify? So, so are you? you th thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, um, are you specifically talking about the outdoor dining that occurred as being is, as referenced as successful, or are you talking about the potential permanent uh, uh, infrastructure improvements being necessary? It it seemed to. Uh, 
say in the opening statement of the yep. study that the, the seasonal closure yep. of Main Street was successful. Yep. So and you I were, read that and I said, I'm not saying it's been unsuccessful, but I haven't seen anything that we did see some data, I think, after year one. Yep. But since then, I haven't seen anything. Maybe it's been out there. It doesn't mean it hasn't been. It yeah. hasn't happened. But I, I mean, I'm not here this evening to defend outdoor dining and whether it was successful or not. But I'd be happy to come up, come back another night, and and talk about all the positive attributes that that it did do. The one metric I will give you, and I don't need data to you know in hand to to, to say this because you can just visually look at it. But we have almost a, a, a zero percent vacancy rate on Main Street, and so that one statistic alone should tell us that we're doing the right thing compared to a lot of our other municipalities or like communities. A lot of like communities, and when I say like communities, I'm talking about mill cities. You know, we're talking about Lowell, we're talking about Lawrence, we're talking about mill cities um, and what their downtowns look like, Fitchburg, uh, Lemonster. And I can assure you, our downtown is gangbusters, leaps and bounds ahead of those comparable Mill City communities. And a lot of it is because of the forethought that uh, folks well before us put into planning of the downtown. Um, and you know, extended outdoor dining might be something more recent that we did to help uh, continue to have a strong, strong downtown. But the reason why that particular statement or sentiment was in the study was it was the genesis and the rationale for going back and wanting to look at the 2015 study. And really, tonight's conversation is just, are we on the right track for talking about the circulation of downtown? Um, and making sure the street circulation is going in a way that um, Engineer Hudson and Director Sullivan and Director Hannon uh, can, can feel confidence in making representations and developing some designs and potentially spending some taxpayer money on that is ultimately representative of what the community would like to do. We had been hearing anecdotally over the years that it is very difficult to move from the Veterans Memorial Parkway to our west through the downtown. And it has been talked about ways and strategies in which we can move the vehicles uh, west to east in an easier way. And that comes about with reversing West Pearl Street. And we want to ensure that if we continue along the path of developing a design that can accommodate West Pearl Street being reversed, um, we are doing so with, with you know, the understanding of, of the Board of Aldermen and the, and the Board of Public Works uh, to ensure that we're working in, in the direction that they like. Follow up, please. Follow up. In looking at the study, I did not see uh, input endorsement from Nashua Public Safety as far as changing traffic flow, road diets, things like that. Have, have they seen this? Have they endorsed it? Thoughts? Matt, do you want to, or? Well, you're welcome to. Yeah, I no. want to follow up on something else okay. you said, too, so. So, in, so again, in 2015, and prior to that, it happened, I would say, in the 2013-2014 era, there was community outreach, extensive stakeholder engagement that occurred that developed these recommendations. And so what was, in the, what was done more recently was just ensuring that the data was still accurate um, and still uh, uh, appropriate that we could stand behind it and we weren't doing anything uh, that would be uh, ill-advised. Um, we did not do any community, out, uh, community stakeholder engagement because we haven't started designing of anything. But if we were to do that, that would be the first thing that I think we should do. Mm. Um, and, and I'm speaking specifically about Main Street. Mm -hmm. We will be starting the design on the Walnut Street Oval um, and there is actually a local stakeholder engagement meeting set up. Mm -hmm. And we want to make sure people are attending that, but we want to make sure we're giving our design professionals clear guidance that this is the expectation and the value of the community as they take the jumping off point on developing the design. And that's what tonight's conversation is really about. Okay. Uh, Director Sullivan. Just a brief comment. I think we maybe should have covered this initially, but. I think it's important to identify that when 
the public works division, engineer Hudson and director photo came to the table initially and really wanted to start a conversation about some of these infrastructure improvements that community development, economic development, and other staff were having. You know, I think it's fair for me to characterize, and I can't see Engineer Hudson right this second, but He's I think he would agree uh, that, you know, I think we, both they had some questions about whether or not these actions were appropriate, and we had some questions about whether some of the uh, traffic-based constraints and other things that have been articulated as part of the mainstream conversations were in fact accurate. And so I think we, we answered the circulation update from a questioning perspective, quite honestly, and I think that actually benefited this process. And what I mean by that is that uh, I think we had real questions about the viability of doing Main Street. Uh, we had heard conversations at this committee as part of the extension of the outdoor dining a conversation two years ago that traffic volumes were substantial and it was impossible to move people through. We also heard that we were doing tremendous amounts of development along the corridor and that certain corridors might be more or less effective than how they had traditionally or initially been designed. And so we really felt the need to take the temperature of how our transportation infrastructure was functioning downtown. I think that's what we tried to do here. I did want to emphasize what I just noted, and that is that we did actually look at proposed uh, development that may happen over the next uh, several year period and used our and used modeling and VHV's expertise to understand how that might impact some of the pinch points that we see in the downtown transportation infrastructure. Again, all of this came from the perspective of making sure that when we had this conversation this evening, we were able to represent in good faith, not that it, there's no chance of failure, but that the chance of failure of any of these particular networks is very, very low based on the improvements that we're talking about here. And so I just wanted to make it clear that we looked very closely at data when coming forward with these recommendations, not only of what is on the ground today, but also what will be coming in the future. And lastly, I just wanted to comment to Alderman Sullivan's question because I think it's a good one. You know, certainly the, the introduction to this study is clear that it relies a lot on the success of, of the outdoor dining program. Perhaps we could have chosen different language there. I think I've said in public session before that the outdoor dining was really sort of a, a foot in the door in the sense, perhaps an unanticipated one. And what I mean by that is that it facilitated a conversation, not just for all of you and us, certainly, but for the community about how it wanted to envision its downtown. And argue about the look of the barriers, the restaurants themselves, some of the traffic. What we, I think, have started to hear staff, and I hope you've heard as aldermen as well, is that people are starting to talk about other communities that have gone to a more permanent solution that has more public realm space. So be it for outdoor dining or for recreating or for other civic space, that's the consensus that I'm beginning to hear in the community. It may not be about outdoor dining in all cases, but right. that idea of using our downtown real estate most effectively that's what I think is really driving a lot of the conversation that's reflected in this, in this study here. Mm -hmm. and, and what I think this study also did was, uh, it, remember back in 2013, 2014, it was theory. And what we actually have now is actuals. Mm -hmm. And it's proven out that the parkway is acting as the relief valve that people thought it would. And so that's, that's what the data showed us. And so the data showed us that we have this parkway, the parkway's performing, and it's actually doing what it was supposed to do, and it's gonna to continue to do what it needs to do and only improve the situation on Main Street. So if you, if you so endeavor to make these more permanent infrastructure improvements, which for the record, I recommend that you do, I would never do anything, uh, you know, this, uh, you know, in, in temporary fashion, but make these permanent infrastructure improvements, you know that you have the parkway performing like the way it needed to, that's all. Oh, I will. I'm going to endorse this. I, I like the ideas of the Water Street, the Walnut, because uh, to contrary to what you said, it's frustrating for me when I go down the Veterans Memorial Parkway because once I get over the Milliard Bridge and then I go, it, it just seems like everything's great, and then Difficult. whoa, then I'm in some type of a rat's <laughs> nest, and and I really. Yeah. I mean, I, kn I know the city like the back of my hand, but you want to get here, but then you end up down here. And I think, so when I saw this, I said, yeah, we got to do this and we got to do that. And so that's what I like about the plan. And I just want to make sure that that doesn't get lost. And, and, that's and I really didn't want to take this infrastructure meeting and turn it into a PEDC meeting. So I just wanted that's to, right. just to put that out there. So, so, so again, Mr. Chairman, uh, we're just looking for that high level direction. And that's, that's all we're really looking for at this time. 
there will be a conversation about the other elements of this and whether you know the design it meets your your values but at the end of the day we really just want to make sure we're giving good policy direction at this time yes. Alderman Thibodeau did you have something um, I did but I'm good at the moment okay good uh, Alderman Clay thank you um, adding on to uh, what um, Alderman uh, Sullivan had to, to say the I like all these changes, specifically the West Pearl. And from the date that we started designing the Performing Arts Center, I was one of those people that kept saying, turn, turn West Pearl around. It, it does then help the Veterans Parkway become the release valve of bringing people to there, dropping them at either one of our parking garages and getting them off Main Street. Um, I like the idea of, of really thinning Main Street, but as I said before, we can't do that until we have those back streets all done, and that's what this plan looks like it does, is that mm -hmm. it reconfigures the back streets mm -hmm. so that people don't have to use Main Street. And being in Ward 3, where that's our Main Street to go to the Southern New Hampshire Hospital, or um, as has been stated, a through street rather than the Everett, um, uh, rather than the Everett, you know, so this has always been important to me. Um, I think thinning it the proper way, putting in good sidewalks, good bike things, will also help with the traffic flow and the safety. Um, we have too many near misses where people just cross wherever they want, no matter how many crosswalks we put on there. So I think thinning that cross is the most important thing. So I, I am definitely for this. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, seeing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Okay, moving to the end of the agenda. New business ordinances? None. Table and committee? None. General discussion? Alderman Sullivan. Good discussion tonight around downtown. I think it's, I think it needed to be had. I, I'm anxious to see kind of where, you know, the long-term plan of, of downtown is. I, uh, just my own opinion, I, I, I look at Manchester and Concord and I, going there so many times, I think sometimes downtown Nash was a bit of a disadvantage only because it's so far off the highway while the other two cities, it's so close. It seems you get off, you take a right or a left, and you're, and you're downtown. It's my hope that some of these changes that we made tonight will make that trip from exit six down to downtown will, will help. Uh, and so we can you know, see, finally see maybe the, um, the realization and, and, and the potential of what downtown can be. So I, I think these are good discussions that need to be had, and I. I love new ideas, especially around uh, some of the traffic flows. I think it's good. Thanks. Good. Okay. Further uh, general discussion? <coughs> Seeing none, I'll open up for public comment again. Anybody? Uh, I'll direct to Sullivan. Uh, thank you, uh, committee members. I just wanted to emphasize what Director Cummings had said about the Walnut Street Oval Local Concerns meeting will be tomorrow <laughs> evening at 6 p.m. Uh, upstairs in the auditorium here. Uh, it will be a generally open forum with a brief presentation at the beginning, but really with the intent of collecting input relative to needs, opportunities, challenges related to the oval area um, and the, that scope of work area. Um, hope to see you there. If you can't make it, please feel free to connect with myself, Engineer Hudson, really anyone here in the audience from city staff about any concerns that you might have. We're very early in the uh, alternative design development process and so now is a good time to, to be a part of that so please just feel free to reach out to us and I will just say there will also be a Walnut or rather West Hollis Street corridor study meeting coming up I'll share a separate communication with all of you about that that will be taking place at DPW uh, over the coming month as well so it's a big month for transportation project planning thank you very good uh, another person Okay, same rules apply, name, address. David, David Fiore, 23 Norton Street. Um, 
I, I wanted to say one that I, I do hope you, you folks will, will look at our complete streets policy. It, it is very much in line with much of what's been said here today. And I wanted to kind of make a, an observation that sort of over all of the things that were discussed. What I often heard, like in the parking discussion and even in the last discussion, um, a desire to make sure that we uh, maximize traffic flow. And I just want to point out that you get what you subsidize, right? Now, if you think about Southern California, I used to live in Southern California, and when they first started moving towards a car-centric design, the vision was, oh, you'll be able to get everywhere, and you know, it's going to be easy. And at the time, it was, because there weren't that many cars, right? But then they had all these highways, and the number of cars increased dramatically. And, and then they said, oh, well, we need more lanes. And they, I don't care how many, I've been on, I've been on like six lane highways in Southern California, six lanes in each direction, and it's still crowded, and the, and the commute is horrendous. So incre if you increase the ability of the city to carry traffic, what you will get is more traffic, right? So let's invest in the things that are going to make the city more livable, more desirable, more prosperous. And that would be bike, pedestrian uh, infrastructure. And if you look at our, our complete street study, uh, uh, um, proposal rather, on page two at the top, a number of studies are cited which show, one, one, there's one particular statistic that I thought was very interesting, that in fully pedestrianized downtowns, there was an 83% increase in business activity. That's, that's hugely significant and makes, you know, ma will make, I came to Nashua and I said, this could be the best city in New England. We've got, we've got a river, we've got this historic downtown. Um, I feel like we've got the bones of something really amazing. So, there it is. Thank you. Uh, is another one? Yes, same rules apply. Hello, I'm Nate DeSelms. I live at 34 Bates Drive. I just wanted to quickly add on to what David said about you know, making the downtown a better place to be. If the thought process is, okay, I'm gonna get in my car and I'm gonna go to one destination downtown with the road systems that have been put in place, I'm just gonna go to that one destination downtown, I'm gonna do the thing I thought I would do, get back in my car and I'm gonna leave. If the downtown is more walkable, easier to access, bikeable, you know, I might go downtown in any way, or I might drive there and just put my car in a parking garage somewhere, and then if I can easily and pleasantly walk somewhere else, well, maybe I'm gonna go get a coffee. Oh, there's a furniture store there, that's cool, and I pop in. And your experience really changes, and I think that's the experience we all want downtown. We all wanna enjoy when we're down there and maybe spend a little extra time and enjoy it. So, just wanted to add that on, thank you. Okay, anybody else from the public? Public comment? Seeing none, further remarks by Alderman? Alderman Clay. Uh, yes, thank you. And, and I'd like to, um, to thank those from the public that came from Nashua Strong and so on. And I think um, what Director Cummings, Director Sullivan, and um, uh, Chris from VHB all had to say was that we do need to look towards a more walkable, more bikeable downtown, and I think that's where we're trying to head by creating the, the streets on the, on the back side of it that allow for the passing of it, brings us to parking garages, et cetera, which would then encourage people to stop, to park, to shop. So um, thank you for all your advocacy. You do great work, and um, I know I hear from Mr. Fiore, and I hope to hear from others as well. Um, it, we don't always agree, <laughs> but I think it starts the conversation and it's needed to be heard. So thank you for an engaged public. I appreciate that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're welcome. Okay, uh, seeing no other comment, Alderman Clay, do you have a motion? Yes, um, I motion to adjourn. Okay, motion is to adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? We are adjourned. 9.14. At what time? 9.14. 9.14. Yep. Yeah.